Hello everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Gaming in the Wild, a video games podcast about games from the artistic, creative side of the tracks, from indie to AAA. My name's John, I'm your host, and this week in Reykjavik, um, I am recording during a huge windstorm, which I guess is not unusual at this time of the year, um, so I'm hoping that you can't hear the windows rattling, but it's a very dark, atmospheric night um, in the city tonight and I do actually have a pretty dark and atmospheric game to review uh, this episode it's a game that I've been waiting for all year I actually looked back and saw a list that I wrote out at the start of the year for the Radical Art Review outlining some of my most anticipated games of 2021 and this was top of the list it was the first game that I mentioned and it's finally here it is Solar Ash the follow-up to Hyperlight Drifter by Alex Preston and Heart Machine. It's a game that I've been very excited about since I first saw it. I was a huge Hyperlight Drifter fan, and I've been dying to play something more, especially when we saw those first reveals that showed that it was going to be a 3D game um, focused on movement with a similar brilliant colour palette and just a a great aesthetic. So I've been very excited for this game. Um, It came out on the 2nd, I got a code for it that day, Um, I played it for five hours as soon as I started it up. I just could not put it down and finished it within a couple days. And so I've been all the way through Solar Ash and I'm looking forward to talking about it today. Um, But before I get on to Solar Ash, I'll run through a couple of other things that I've been playing. Um, I saw a couple of people playing uh, Genesis Noir on Twitch um, and on various YouTube channels. And I think it's, it's that time of the year where people are trying to catch up on some indie games or highly rated games from earlier in the year, just to check out the best titles and see if they're going to scrape into their their games of the year lists. So I thought maybe it's my time to check out Genesis Noir as well. I've had it downloaded on my Xbox um, for ages now, and I've kept meaning to play it um, and not really gotten into it. I think I played the first five, ten minutes, but wasn't quite in the mood. Um, If you don't know this game, it's a a very interesting indie game. It's a line-drawn, monochrome story game, uh, white on black, uh, line drawings, in which the start of the universe is depicted, the Big Bang, but it's depicted in a, a really interesting mashup of different motifs. Genesis Noir, so it's, it's a film noir style detective game about the beginning of the universe with a really cool jazz soundtrack. And gameplay that uh, evolves from moment to moment, pretty much. It's one of those games where the gameplay never really establishes itself, but rather just continues to evolve and to give you interesting, strange new tasks to do. Um, and you're trying to get to the bottom of um, what's causing the Big Bang, or someone that is attempting to stop the Big Bang, or something like that. There's some kind of mystery, and every level that you do is an investigation into the the Genesis Noir mystery. And so I played um, a couple of hours of that game, and I've I've quite enjoyed it. Um, It hasn't entirely gripped me, but I was having a fairly good time with it. Um, It's a little simplistic, um, and it seems to trade largely on art style and music um, and the aesthetic of the whole thing, which I am fine with. I do love a game that just has that kind of vision and sticks with it. And Genesis Noir is definitely one of those. I think I will get to the end of it before I give like a full verdict on the game, because there is a lot to like about it. It's quite unusual. Um, I do like that jazz soundtrack. It's not often that you hear full-on uh, jazz music in a game soundtrack. There's much more um, ambient music and that kind of thing, and electronic music. So it's it's really interesting mixture of stuff, and it's definitely an in- intriguing game. And I am going to get to the end of it, because I want to see how they play out this this weird story they've concocted. So I'm going to play a little bit more of Genesis Noir on, uh, on Game Pass. I also dipped back into Paper Mario The Origami King on Switch. I'm continuing to kind of hack away through that one. The initial uh, blush is off the rose with that one. I really enjoyed the first couple worlds, um, but I feel like I've seen a lot of the gameplay now, and it's starting to feel a little long. Um, I often have this problem with Mario games, um, which might be a heretic thing to say and a terrible thing to say, but I have actually um, 
struggled with Mario games in the past and really felt like I had to force my way through them, especially the latter day ones. And this one is obviously, it's a, it's a paper Mario, so it's more of a Mario-based RPG with turn-based combat and a story and an overworld and all of that kind of stuff. And it is a very joyful and fun game. It's very colourful. It's a Mario game in which Mario is in a paper world that is made out of uh, paper mache and paper, and it has lots of holes torn into the world. So you might see a black hole in the ground and you can see a wire mesh beneath it. And you have to fill in these holes by throwing, like unleashing a big blast of confetti. And so Mario is constantly unleashing blasts of confetti and it gives it a really nice celebratory atmosphere. And it has that trademark kind of quirky um, Mario humour. And it's it's all round. It's, it's been a really fun time. But I am feeling like the the game's time is outstretching the amount of mechanics that it has to offer at the moment. So I'm grinding my way through it. I pick it up and I play 20 minutes and put it down again. Um, I've kind of made a promise with myself that I will finish the Origami King before I start Metroid Dread. Um, I don't know if I will live up to that promise, but I'm trying to not put it down, let it gather dust. Um, so I'm going to continue with the Origami King and see if I can recapture that um, that initial joy that I had with the game and see if it picks up in the final act. I'm getting towards the final act now. And over on PlayStation, I also played a little bit this this week. I played Life is Strange True Colors. I was a big fan of the original Life is Strange game, did a podcast about it earlier this year, Um, and so I was really happy to see the first sales coming onto True Colours. Um, It was the first Life is Strange game to not be released episodically, but it came out as a full title, and so far it's it's made a really good impression on me. It's got a great story, as you expect from these games. They are these kind of wistful autumnal third-person story games in which um, there's always like a nice folky indie rock soundtrack um, and the characters are these kind of quite relatable early 20-something characters and they have very rich worlds. So for example, there's a scene in this game where you start working in a bar after returning to your hometown and as you walk around the bar you can see the different people sitting at the different tables and you can hear your character's thoughts about them. You can see articles about local history pinned up onto the walls. You can see artwork, you can see out into the street and everywhere you look in the environment there are little icons that appear when you can examine something. And I think it's a trademark of the Life is Strange games that there is some light puzzle gameplay um, but they are largely unchallenging games that are mostly about telling you a story and I love the way that they tell the story they they tell the story um, with these beautiful little environmental details that fill in a really colourful and rich picture of the time period in which the games are set and of the characters that are involved um, it really fleshes out its game world in a, a really pleasing way. And I find Life is Strange games quite relaxing in that way. They're almost like um, very playable visual novels. Um, there's a lot of text content. There's a lot of good voice acting. And these games have a whole mood. They really do. This one is set in a small rural American town um, in the mountains, a mining town. There is an old mine nearby. There are wooded mountains in every direction with snow on the top. Life is Strange games always have this this wonderful um, magic hour autumn feeling to them. There's just something very lyrical about them. Um, so I've only played the opening part of Life is Strange True Colors, but I'm enjoying it a lot so far. It's, a, it's another good addition to that series. I think people who played the first Life is Strange, which also, also has a paranormal aspect to the story, um, the games that came after the sequels weren't as well received, Um, And I can see why, having touched on them but not really stuck with them. But True Colors feels like it's a return to that that original formula that made the first game um, feel quite special. So I'm looking forward to playing that one across the coming weeks. It seems like a nice winter game. I think it's a game that you can relax with. And when I finished it, perhaps I will do a full episode about it. So before I get into talking about Solar Ash, I will just briefly mention that this show is patron-supported. 
you can join up as a member on Patreon at patreon.com slash gaminginthewild for as little as a dollar a month or three or five or whatever your local currency is. Um, and for that, you will get an invite to the Discord community where you can talk to me and other listeners about what we're playing. You will get sale recommendations from me in the Patreon feed and a couple of exclusive episodes each year, usually one about uh, video game music and perhaps a spoiler cast I was thinking about doing a inscription spoiler cast if enough people in the Discord have played that game to warrant one for the members. Maybe I will do that because it's a game with a lot of intrigue that I couldn't really touch upon in my review of inscription. So you'll get those kind of things. It's a really nice welcoming community. There's a lot of great people there. We have a top fives channel. Um, This week we've been talking about our top five video game soundtracks and our top five video game stories. And it's always fascinating to see what people say, see if there are any games that I have missed or not played, uh, adding things to the wish list, and it's just a really good time. So you're very welcome to come and join us and support the podcast, whether it's your first episode today or you're a long-time listener, and you can do so at patreon.com slash gaminginthewild. And thanks very much to all of my existing patrons. I really appreciate the support, and thanks very much to you, if that's something that sounds interesting. And with that said, let's move on and talk about the featured game of the episode, the highly anticipated Solar Ash. So Solar Ash is a 2021 game developed by Heart Machine, a studio headed up by Alex Preston, the developer of Hyperlight Drifter. It's published by Annapurna Interactive, who I'm happy seem to have gotten their swagger back after a a string of three titles that weren't so good earlier this year. Solar Ash is a really good way, a really strong way for them to finish the year. I really like Annapurna. Um, It's out on the PlayStation 4 and 5 and on PC. It's a PlayStation console exclusive for now. I played it on a PlayStation 5 and it ran pretty well. It wasn't quite as buttery smooth as you might expect on that system, but I'm not sure if that's to do with power so much as optimization. I'll be interested to see if it's smoothed out. But it ran smoothly, I didn't have any crashes or issues, just a couple of drop frames here and there. And the developer describes it as Journey through a surreal, vivid, highly stylized world filled with mystery, wild high-speed traversal, endearing characters, and massive enemy encounters. The void is calling. And my take on this one is, Solar Ash is a mesmerizing journey into a black hole full of shattered worlds. It combines slick, satisfying movement, epic boss encounters, and a melancholy story into a thrilling and resonant whole. And the critics have warmed to this one. It's got a score of 80 at the moment, which is broadly positive reviews. At the time of recording, there aren't enough um, playthroughs logged on how long to beat for it to have an aggregate time yet. But I've seen in some reviews, the critics have said that it took them seven hours to complete the story. It took me 11.5 hours, but that was on a 100% run with all of the optional side quests and all of the, the different suits collected. That is not the same as the Platinum Trophy though. I did get 100% complete notification from the game, but to get the Platinum you have to do it on the hardcore difficulty and you have to do an under three hour run. And there are some um, extremely scattered, smaller collectibles you have to get all of. So it's not the Platinum, but I, I did feel like I saw what the game had to offer in full. So what is Solar Ash? Solar Ash is a third person action adventure platformer. It's set in the same universe as Hyperlight Drifter um, and it shares a lot of the brilliant aesthetic that really made that game sing. Um, If you haven't played Hyperlight Drifter, it was a kind of a western sci-fi in which you play a, a drifter samurai in a broken down world with titans crumbling in the landscape. Um, And it was a very 
hard, very good, very stylish pixel art game that had a fantastic palette, a fantastic colour palette. The pixel art is second to none, and the gameplay was very, very tight. Um, and despite the fact that it was quite difficult, and I bounced on my first playthrough for that reason, um, this game really kicked my ass, Hyperlight Drifter. I came back to it, I finished it, and it is a beloved game for me now. So I've been very excited. Um, it was made by Alex Preston as a solo developer, but it was such a big hit that the Heart Machine studio has got a lot more money flowing through it, a lot more people on the staff. And Solar Ash was actually listed in the PlayStation 5 launch lineup. So that's quite a, uh, a leap for Heart Machine from a, a one-man operation making a pixel art game through to making a huge production like Solar Ash. Well, maybe not huge, but a big production like Solar Ash uh, with full support from Sony and all of that kind of thing. Um, so it's in the same universe as Hyperlight Drifter, but it's not connected story-wise. You can tell that it belongs to the same... Um, imagination. You can tell that it's come from the same imagination. It shares that that bright neon palette and that fantastical sci-fi setting. And it also shares a certain darkness with Hyperlight Drifter. There is a famous story that Alex Preston has been chronically ill throughout his life. And the main character in Hyperlight Drifter is um, a warrior, but will sometimes stop and cough and cough up blood and stumble and have episodes in that game. And so they are quite visceral games and solar ash really carries that on um one of the main pickups that you get in the game are these floating globules of what look like hemoglobin or something um that act as the game's currency um, and there are also bodies scattered around this solar ash world just as there were in hyperlight drifter there are themes of uh, mortality and uh, worrying about what happens after death and infirmity and endings. Um, so it's got quite an existential feel to it, mixed with this bright science fiction environment and a great um, aesthetic and design sensibility. And it's a really good mixture. And I think that Heart Machine has managed to carry that across from Hyperlight Drifter into Solar Ash, which is something that I was very happy to see. Um, it's a real pleasure to look at, just like Hyperlight Drifter was, and I really, I really felt like I drank this game in. It sounds wonderful, and it looks wonderful, and it plays well too. Um, and it did feel like spending time back in that universe, which was very welcome for me. Uh, the soundtrack, I think, is great. Um, you've heard some of it in this podcast. It's a Vangelis-style, I would say, gothic, electronic, orchestral kind of vibe to it. It's often very ambient, but it really picks up when you get into boss battles or stressful situations. And it gets this kind of gothic uh, house thing going on. It, it feels like murky Berlin club music at those moments. Kind of gothic, kind of cool. Um, and generally this game is a, a stepping up from Hyperlight Drifter in, in every department. Um, it's a great move into 3D and it really raises the bar for Heart Machine. So in this game, you play Ray... You are the youngest member of a team of Void Runners, and Void Runners are speedy, nimble operatives who use Void Tech. Uh, Void Tech is an experimental alien technology that was found on the, this race's home world buried deep in the ground. And whilst they don't really understand Void Tech, they have adapted it into various tools. So it's an experimental technology. They're not exactly sure um, about the ins and outs of it. There is a little bit of lore about how Void Tech runs. It's something to do with combining protons and antiprotons, particles that both exist and don't exist at the same time. And these Void Runners use Void Tech to power their scanners, their shields, their weapons, and their boosters. Um, and they are just badasses, really. They're fast moving uh, warriors and kind of agents. They just get things done. And the game takes place in a a very strange environment called the Ultra Void. And this is a black hole that's been pulling in planets. And as the planets are pulled in, they crumble, they fly apart, they turn into dust. But chunks of those planets float in the void. And so as you move around this game, you'll skate across purple and mint and really brightly coloured clouds. But the clouds have land islands in them with the remnants of different civilizations from worlds of fallen victim to the ultra void very very cool and at the start of the game 
you realise that your home planet is in danger of being pulled into the Ultra Void. You can see it in the sky above the game. And so what the game is, it's a mission where these six Void Runners have come into the Ultra Void. They've fired in a giant machine called the Star Seed, which is like a, a tower block sized device built using Void Tech. And what they're going to try and do is collapse the Ultra Void and save their home worlds. And that's basically the story of Solar Ash. That's the scenario, that's the setup for the game. It's a game that happens in an extreme environment made out of smashed worlds with the remnants of those different civilizations. Um, so you're walking through the, the, the wrecked remnants of civilizations. It's got a very heavy, post-apocalyptic, kind of doom-laden melancholy to the whole thing. But that's offset by this sense of wonder. It also has a sense of discovery. Um, you do find documents from those civilizations and you find very interesting backstories to the worlds that have arrived here um, and there is some intrigue to the mission itself as well because the starseed when you arrive you're the last member of your void runner team to touch down in the ultra void um, when you get there you can't get in touch with any of the other agents any of the other void runners they're all out of communication range you can't get in touch with them the starseed is not operable something has gone wrong um, and you meet an ai called sid Sid is kind of half-functioning. Um, Sid is like a hologram, um, an AI that helps the, the Void Runner team to run and to do all of their missions. And Sid tells you that the different nodes that each agent went out into the Ultra Void to plant into key locations to collapse the Void are uh, out of order, and you have to go and unclog them and find out what's going on. And so that's the setup for the game. That's the structure and the story and the scenario. Um, but let's talk about the movement, because the movement in this game is really the star of the show. If you've played The Pathless that came out this time last year, it's strikingly similar to that. It's a very high-speed game. You, you can run. If you hold down L2, you'll start skating. Um, and this is really fast movement, where you start gathering speed very quickly. So you can cover a lot of ground in this game. Um, and you can turn very quickly. You can hit R2 to do a boost, uh, which will up your speed even more. Um, you start with a double jump that goes really far. Um, I think it's the game in which you can jump the furthest. You can cover huge gaps in this game. And so the game really rewards momentum. It's a game that wants you to go fast, that wants you to play fast. And something that I've said often on this show is that when a game gets traversal right, then a lot of other stuff will slot into place around that. I think that if it's a pleasure to move through a game, if the basic activities of the game, getting from A to B and using the different systems and just moving, just traveling through the game is fun, then that goes a huge way to making the game a fun experience. And the movement in Solar Ash is just brilliant. It's so satisfying. It's so fluid. You flow through this game. It's very easy to get into a flow state. Sometimes it's so enjoyable running around these crazy environments that the game sets up for you. That I kind of lost track of what I was doing. I just forgot what my objective was. And I just ran around looking at the environment, just taking jumps, uh, finding ramps, finding rails to grind on. Um, there are climbable walls that you can leap onto with a kind of a black goop on them that you can climb up. There are hookshot points, so you have a grapple. So if you come into range of a hookshot point, you can hit R1 and grapple onto a point that will suck you right onto it. Um, and so you're very, very mobile in this game, and it's really fun just to move around, just to run around, just to use your boost, take jumps, chain moves together. Um, and the game is set up to be a giant... A really fun obstacle course. And so when you come into each world, you can you can use a scanner, um, which is you hold down L1, and then uh, areas of interest will be highlighted in the game, so you don't have to go into a separate map screen. The game doesn't have a map, really, um, which I did find to be a little bit of a failing sometimes, but I can see what they've tried to do here. They've um, issued having a uh, a traditional map, and instead giving you this scanner that will direct you to points of interest. Um, there is a map screen, but it's really just five different tiles for each biome, and you can warp between them. Um, so you come into the game area, you can use your scanner. You have to find Sid, Sid the, the AI, 
Um, she has a station somewhere in each level. And when you find her, you can uh, turn that on and she'll mark for you the, the mission points in each area, the places where you have to go and clear away whatever is clogging up all of the machinery of the star seed. And when you've cleaned up four, four or five different areas, then you'll have a, a huge boss fight. Each area has a, a gargantuan colossus boss. And the bad guys in this game are made out of a kind of a black goop that looks very oily and gelatinous. And it's kind of coated certain areas of the landscape. So you'll find these areas that have just been really clogged up and overcome by this black goop. And they have a red eye in this huge sticky mass. And this is one of the main puzzle mechanics of the game. You have to clear these away to move on. And it's an interesting one, because each one is like a, a mini-action puzzle. So you'll find these areas of black goop, they're all completely different. One might be wrapped around like a, an old rail station, and another might be in a stairwell, or around the top of a wall. So they're all very different shapes and in very different locations. And the way that you clear them is quite interesting. As you approach them, you'll see a needle sticking out of them, a little bit like an acupuncture needle. You can hit it, and it will vanish, and it will then illuminate a nerve running through this black goop to the next one. And what this does is it creates a mini assault course that you have to do in a set time. You only have a couple of seconds to get between one acupuncture needle and the next, and you have to get through them in sequence and strike each one down, and then you've cleared away that area of black goop. And so these puzzles are actually really fun. At first, I wasn't quite sure if I was going to gel with this gameplay, because they are each um, quite precise, time-based puzzles. And that's not something that I really excel at. Um, these, kind of channel, these kind of challenges often appear in games, but they are often optional. You know, there's like in uh, the Assassin's Creed games or in Immortals, Phoenix Rising, there are often these time challenges like get from A to B in a certain time or carry out a task in a, in a, quick, a quick time. Um, and I'm not that good at them. I'm not that good at precision gaming generally. But these were actually really fun because you have to look at the, the places where these different acupuncture needles appear and then you have to kind of plan your route, and it's not always what you think it's going to be. Um, you can climb on the, the black goop, but it's very, very slow. So you, you really want to be skating and finding a way to travel as quickly as possible around this black goop, solving the puzzle, striking down of those acupuncture needles and clearing that away. And these turned out to be really fun. Um, it's a nice little mechanic. So as you're exploring this open world, that's that's the main gameplay thing that you'll be doing. There are also collectibles that you can find. There are the hemoglobin that I described earlier. There are journals um, left by explorers who have been through this space before. Um, there are archives of the civilizations, the wreckage of which you are walking through. Um, there are also signs of the other Void Runners. So as you are searching this world and trying to get the star seed back online to collapse that black hole and save your planet, you're also looking for signs of your lost team, and you will find pods that they have left in obscure locations where they have camped on their own journey through the Ultra Void, and, and each one of those contains a voice log, and you'll start to piece together the story of what happened to your team as you're moving through this environment. There are also basic enemies. There's only four or five different types of them, just really small, goopy creatures with different abilities. There's a flying one, there's a, a wall climber one that shoots at you. There are a couple of different ground-based ones. And the combat is pretty easy in this game, the general combat, um, because it's meant to be played at speed. So really, you are skating fast, you're going past enemies, you're taking them out with one or two hits uh, and carrying on on your way. Only very late in the game does the combat become more challenging when there are different combinations of enemies and different levels of parkour that you're kind of expected to be carrying out. Um, and the enemies can disrupt that if they hit you. So you have to clear enemies and move fast at the same time. Very fun, very propulsive. And the finale of each area is an anomaly. And the anomalies are Shadow of the Colossus style bosses. They are huge um, animals made out of this black goop. Um, and 
The way that you take them out is a little bit similar to that acupuncture needle striking that I told you about. Each boss has three phases, and you have to first find a way onto these giant creatures, which are moving around the game area. So you can skate around them, try not to get stamped on or shot at, find a grapple point, and then you pull yourself up onto these giant animals. And this is very impressive. The music really ramps up. Um, and it's a really interesting one because it's not traditional combat. You have to travel across the animal at speed, striking down these needles. Um, and after you've done 10 or 20 or more in a row, and this involves a lot of very rapid traversal and trying not to be thrown off or fall off and trying not to run out of time because you'll just be thrown down and have to start again. After you've done a successful run and taken out all of those needles, there'll be a moment at which you reach the eye of the creature, drive in your sword. And each boss, has th each boss has three phases, so you have to do this three times. The last phase is always the hardest, because they turn molten, which means that you can't land on them almost anywhere. You have to be jumping with precision across these huge bone plates that coat these bosses. Um, and these are really fun, too. Um, it's the kind of gameplay that I would have imagined myself to have a lot of trouble with, uh, requiring, as it does, quite a lot of precision. But I actually found it really good and challenging. I think partly because the movement is so satisfying, partly because the game looks beautiful and the palette is amazing, and because these bosses are so dramatic, and the way that they circle the, the game environment, you're travelling through the environment and you're travelling across the boss, and it's just very, very engaging and fun. I didn't get very frustrated with this game, which is surprising to me. I feel like it's it's tailor-made to be um, something that I would find frustrating, having to repeat um, certain precise movements again and again and again until you get a perfect run. But it actually felt quite seat-of-the-pants and a little bit um, loose, like there was room for improvisation, um, there was room for taking a little wrong turn and getting back on track, I played it on the standard difficulty, um, and I felt that the bosses were really well put together. I felt like the whole game was well put together, actually. I very rarely found myself frustrated with it. Um, it's a really enjoyable experience all round. Yeah, they're, they're really epic, those Colossus battles, and I think that anyone who has played and enjoyed uh, Shadow of the Colossus or The Pathless will really enjoy Solar Ash too. So I'll finish off this review just by running through my, my favourite things and a couple of small criticisms of this game. That's a very really small section in my notes here, honestly. I remember sometimes reviewing games like Lost in Random or Kana Bridge of Spirits. I had like 20 points on the negatives list um, to work my way through in the podcast and 10 in the good or 15 in the good. Here I have just three, three notes and they're very small ones in the negative section. Um, so those are that the... The gravity scrolling in this game, it's something that I haven't touched upon actually, but as you're traveling around this environment, it's a 360 degree environment. Sometimes you'll be skating down a column of clouds and you can circle the column. So you can be, um, it's a little bit like Mario Galaxy when you're running around on those small spheres and jumping between them. There is a, a dash of that to Solar Ash. But the gravity scrolling doesn't feel entirely fluid and 360 degree in that same way as we've seen in Mario Galaxy and as we've seen in Psychonauts 2 recently. That game had an excellent way of handling gravity scrolling. It was very, very smooth. You could run across a ground and then up onto a wall and the camera would just swing behind you in a way that felt very very fluid and very very good and and well done in this game it's not quite that smooth it felt to me more like the camera had perhaps six different angles that it would like to be at it, it could be horizontal it could be diagonal, it could be vertical, and it was always trying to find one of those flat planes to rest on 
rather than fluidly moving in a circular motion as you traveled around the world. I'm not sure if I'm explaining this quite right or if you're getting what I mean, but basically it didn't feel like the camera was free-flowing in the same way as the movement was, and that the camera position, it was always felt like it was looking for a, an ideal position. Um, the second one that I've got here is that the climbing can be a little bit sketchy, um, as you're climbing up these black goopy surfaces to try and get to high places. Sometimes you will jump while you're climbing to try and scoot up. I think this is in every game ever, this mechanism of jumping up a little further, like in Breath of the Wild and other games with, with climbing. But in this game, if you try and do that, you might well fall off. Um, sometimes when you reach the edge of the climbable area, unpredictable things happen. Um, you might drop, you might uh, get stuck. So that was just one small, very, very, very small critique. Um, also the maps, that's my, my only last note, is that some of the areas are quite large, especially there is one which is a wrecked city. Um, and as I was looking around this city, I was trying to find all the collectibles as well as the the scannable areas of importance. And I found myself going in circles quite a lot. I did wish that there was a map, basically. There is this great scanner system that will show you where your next mission points are, but in terms of differentiating between where you have and haven't been, there is no system for that really. Um, and in the city area, there are lots of skyscrapers around. It's very, very vertical. You're going up rails and through buildings, and it can look a little the same. Um, I didn't find that it was incredibly distinctive in layout, and so I did get a little bit lost a couple of times, and I found myself repeating um, certain play areas and certain sequences when I was trying to find missed collectibles. So I don't think it was quite nailed, um, this, this uh, division between having a very simple blocky map where you can just use for fast travel only, and then having in-game scanner. I felt like perhaps something in between could have worked, Perhaps if more things appeared on the scanner, rather than just mission points, if collectibles appeared on your readout in-game, that would have really helped, I think. A little bit more information, a little bit more map information, however it was implemented, I think would have gone a long way. But those are really my only critiques of the game. Honestly, I absolutely loved this one. I loved the movement, I loved the environment. I haven't even talked about the different biomes, but there is that destroyed city. There is a very vertical shipyard, which is connected by vertical rails that you have to grind up at high speed, um, and you have to just scoot across platforms, skate across platforms, uh, use your hook shot, very, very aerial, with a long drop. There is no fall damage in this game, so if you fall, all you're losing is time. That's something that I really appreciated too. Um, and the environments are just wonderful. There is um, an environment which is like a, a forest of fungus, of different kinds of mushrooms and toadstools. It's very beautiful. Um, the civilizations that you will find as you come through the game as well. There are, there are several different civilizations, the scraps of which are left over just on, on fragments of planets and ultravoids that have been torn apart. But you can still see um, bits of them. So you'll come across these archives, you'll come across interesting characters, um, and just interesting civilizations that had different problems. Um, so there's lots of environmental storytelling, there's lots of nicely done text, I thought. Um, Hyperlight Drifter did not have any text in it, the story was told through pictograms only, so Solar Ash is really developed in that too. It has writing, it has voice acting, I think the voice acting on Ray is excellent. And the audio treatment on the voice is great too. It sounds very, very filtered and um, cool. It sounds like it's coming through some kind of sci-fi uh, microphone helmet device. Um, it just sounds great. The whole game sounds great. The sound design is brilliant. Um, and I think that the, the mixture of elements that we have here, this is a game that has an artistic vision, and it, it really feels like that. It feels like the artistic core of this game is very well developed and well thought out. The story, the design of the characters, the design of Rey with her face mask and her, her suit and her flowing long hair, which is almost like a smoke, it's almost like smoke flowing from her head. Uh, the music in the game, all of the dialogue, the way that the story locks together, and the whole melancholic mood of it. 
It just adds up to something special. I love the themes of the game. I love that these Void Runners are operating in such a strange place where time is strange, where matter is strange, where memory goes a little strange, and where they're dealing with a huge uh, topic. You know, it's very much about mortality. It's about trying to understand your your own life and your own use in existence. It's a very existential game, but it's not heavy. So even though it has these melancholic, big themes, it manages to be enjoyable. And I found the whole game just to be mesmerising. The movement was wonderful. Um, I had fun throughout. I finished it in, I think, three or four sittings. I just really could not put it down. Um, this this goes on to my Games of the Year shortlist easily. It's It's everything that I could have hoped for. That's Solar Ash. I hope you enjoyed that review. I had a really good time with this game. I hope that wasn't too much of a rambling review, and I hope that you got what you needed from it. I really recommend this game. I think it's priced at £25 or 30 something like that. Um, I think it's a bargain. Um, I'm glad that it came out at that price. It seems to be a really top-end indie game, you know. This is a really top-of-the-range indie game. It's one that I'm going to remember. I'm, I'm sure of that. I really had a good time with this one, and I'm sure that I'll play it again too. It's funny that it came out at the same time of the year as The Pathless did. I remember The Pathless coming out last winter, and I had a similarly passionate response to that one. Just the high fantasy setting, the fluid traversal, the, the huge impressive bosses, and this atomized storytelling where you just get all of these little traces of past civilizations through notes and through little data capsules. I love that format, and I really love that Solar Ash and the Pathless are kind of a new take on the open world indie game. Um, they're much less focused on moving between map points and on length. They are quite concise experiences, and that's something that I really like. And if you've played Solar Ash and you would like to tell me your thoughts, you can find me on social media. I'm on Twitter as Gaming in the Wild. I'm also on Twitch, YouTube, Instagram, and all of the other social media, but Twitter's the main place you can find me. I'm also active daily in our Discord server, and if you would like to be a member of that, you can join the Patreon at patreon.com slash gaminginthewild. I'll be back next week with another review. I'm not sure quite what it will be yet. Maybe I will have gotten through Life is Strange True Colors. I'm really enjoying that one. I'm still at the very end of Guardians of the Galaxy as well. Maybe it'll be one of those games. Maybe it will be something else. I will also mention just briefly that I bought a package called Jingle Jam. It was £35 and um, it's a huge package of indie games. It's for charity. It's a really good package. There is another um, package going around for four, £4.99 um, that contains a lot of really great games like Inglet, Signs of the Sojourner, a bunch of indie games that I've covered on this podcast, Cloud Gardens. I have retweeted links to those. So if you are a, P a PC player, and if you like to buy games packages and contribute to good causes, you can find those on my timeline. I've retweeted links to both of them on Twitter. That's Gaming in the Wild. So thanks very much for listening. I'll be back next week with a new show. Take care of yourselves and each other. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>